Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Our relationship with bacteria is changing. Well, our knowledge and understanding is anyway. It's been an adversarial relationship for over a hundred years and with the advent of antibiotics and antimicrobials along with products that promise to make our surfaces and bodies 99.9% antimicrobial and clean, uh, as well as uh, you'll hear of a very symptom-based approach to common health issues, all of those things, well, they're kind of changing. We're learning that the majority of microbes are actually our friends, and we need to learn more about them and how to look after them. My guest today is Dr. Jason Horolak. Jason is a naturopathic physician who has done both his honours and his PhD degrees in the area of intestinal dysfunction, microbiome manipulation and the clinical applications of pre- and probiotics. He's also a herbalist. He has taught health professionals at both the undergraduate and postgraduate level for the past 16 years and is currently the senior lecturer and coordinator of the Evidence-Based Complementary Medicine Program at the University of Tasmania School of Medicine. Jason has written extensively in textbooks and journals and specialises in the treatment of gastrointestinal disorders, both acute and chronic, such as irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel diseases like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and much, much more. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Dr. Jason Horolak. Welcome to the show, Jason. Hey, thanks, Ron. Thanks for the invitation to come in and chat. Now, Jason, I'm picking up a very, very slight accent there, and I know you're based in Tasmania and you've done your PhD. You've done a huge amount of writing. I wonder if you might just share with our listener a little bit of your journey to this point. Yeah, sure. Um, I sometimes forget I have an accent because I sound normal to me, but I did grow up in, in Canada um, at a city called Calgary, which is near the um, Rocky Mountains. So I grew up with that as my sort of local local background and thinking that those beautiful turquoise colored rivers were the norm um, everywhere. Um, little did I know that they're actually quite the exception. Um, and I had, I was one of those aspiring backpackers who was intent to travel around the world, but didn't get that far. I got from you know, Fiji, New Zealand, Australia, and loved, fell in love with Australia and subsequently never left. And that was back in 1992. Um, so I'm somewhat surprised. <laughs> I've been in Australia longer than I was ever in Canada, but I still have, I think, a Canadian <laughs> accent, strangely enough. It's very, it's very soft. It's very soft. I was being picky. <laughs> That's all right. It's good. It's, good. it's still there. Um, I've seen this one from Canada today, and they assumed I was Australian right off the bat. Yeah, but I, but essentially, I fell in love with North New South Wales, where um, where I arrived a few days into Australia and lived up there, and was lucky enough to to study up there. So that's where I did my um, original undergrad training, in, uh, which was a Bachelor of Naturopathy up at Southern Cross University. And then I had a, a lecture in my last year of my my course talk about um, that was talking about dysbiosis um, and leaky gut, and it got me so excited and inspired that I approached. Um, Dr. Stephen Myers right afterwards and said, hey, I want to research this. I want to do my honors degree in this and hopefully my PhD. And then that started my journey. So I started my honors degree back in 2000, which went for a year. And we did some research looking at the impact of a, essentially ran a clinical trial in patients with irritable bowel syndrome and we gave them probiotics and prebiotics and pro medicines to see what impact it would have on their um, essentially got symptoms, but also what impact it would have on what we, we termed at the time microflora, which we now call the, the microbiota. Um, and that subsequently flew into a, to a PhD. So I was lucky enough, in my in my opinion, to spend, you know, five or six years full time only studying the microbiota um, back way before it was a cool and trendy thing to be studying. So, um, it was pretty amazing to see the rise, the meteoric rise of that topic area because you know, it's something that I loved and was passionate about back in that, that time. And there was a you know, dedicated group of microbiome or microbiota researchers around the world that were, you know, numbered in probably 100, 100 people. So you, you read all their papers and be familiar with all the topics and everything that was published every year. Um, and just now it's just the rise in the last 15 years has just been huge. And it's, um, mm. you know, now there's thousands of papers published a year on probiotics, prebiotics, and the gut microbiota. And we're linking, you know, microbiota to a lot more disease conditions 
than than where we were originally. You know, we always knew it had a, a pretty pivotal role in, in human health back in the, the that re- research was clear around that from the 1960s and 70s, but it wasn't widely discussed. Um, but but now it's being widely discussed, and we're seeing it, it's far more important than what we even believed back then. Yeah, um, and medicine's not quick to r- jump on concepts. You said 1960s and 70s, the research was already out there. And I know people in the naturopathy world have been talking about leaky gut for many, many, many years. Yeah. And, and now with the term intestinal permeability, which is essentially the same thing, it's become kind of more medicalized. It's accepted. Yeah, well, it, it's amazing how much research there is out there on intestinal permeability now for, for type 2 diabetes, obesity, you know, these conditions that are, are so commonplace in Western nations. And, and we're seeing huh, that there's actually a leaky gut component of, of these common conditions that still hasn't filtered through to, to your average um, medical doctor on the, on, the, on, the, on the beat. But it's certainly there in research settings that will give another 10 years and your, your more typical um, based practitioner will be on board with some of these concepts because, as you said, it takes a while for it to filter down. Yeah, so first hit the first hit the the journals in the sixties and seventies, but by two thousand and thirty, it should be readily available <laughs> in most GPs' practices. Listen, you mentioned a lot there, and I, and and some of that stuff I want to cover with you today. I thought we might start with microbes because you know there's something that people, whenever they hear the term microbes, they immediately go to. Um, infection, disease, that all comes to mind. But there's, there's clearly, as we've just alluded to, been an image change, a PR change in the last few years. Why are, are microbes now so, I mean, they always have been, but why are we recognising them as being so important? I, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and as someone that was, in, was involved with the field before, I suppose, the, the, the great rise to um, prominence that it is now, I, I think the biggest shift behind that was, was change in research techniques. So we, we could see better what was there. Um, you know, uh, from the late 1800s to the late 1900s, we relied on a technique called culturing to, to uh, look at the world of microbes and certainly to, to ascertain what was in our, our gut. Um, and towards the late 90s, early 2000s, research was coming out suggesting that, that this was uh, insufficient or, uh, or an inadequate technique to to properly assess what was there, and then we essentially switched to using DNA type technology and and it opened up a whole new world. And all of a sudden, we could see that the microbiota did change when we changed diets. It did change when we took antibiotics more than just for a week or two, but actually for months to years. Um, it did change when we took other medications, and it really opened up. Thing, the, research, the research became much more in depth, and we could start making these connections between different disease states because we had technology that was sensitive enough, sensitive enough to see the changes. And I think that's the, the, big, the biggest change because you know we we knew back in the 60s and 70s, 80s that the microbiota was important for optimal immune system function, and then it, that if you took out um, the microbes, and they, they actually did this, they they called you know germ-free rats or germ-free mice or, or nautobiotic models, where they they essentially are born sort of sterile, they give them tons of antibiotics, so they keep them sterile and put them in a little bubble to, to mean that they can't grow microbes. And we, we, what they observed then was that the thymus gland and the spleen would shrink, uh, which are both you know, important immune system organs. And they also found that the capacity of white blood cells to, to deal with invaders dropped dramatically. They just couldn't function properly. And if you'd introduce some poo back into those mice or rats, then they would, those immune system functions would, would improve again. Those thymus gland and spleen would grow again back to normal size. And so some, some of the things we knew about for a long time. But I think really from the early 2000s onwards, we're, they started making this connection between not only you know, immune system health and you know, nutritional health in terms of B vitamins and vitamin K. Again, that was known for a long time, but this connection between microbes and how they regulate metabolism, how they actually impact our mood, um, how they impact your inflammatory milieu more, more generally. And I think that that is perhaps the key thing that's really shifted things around because research has shown that, that, that the composition of the ecosystem that you have, the composition of your microbiota, really determines your inflammatory environment just body-wide, not just in the gut, but body-wide, in that if you've got a predominance of certain species, then that this is a driver of inflammation. And, and you know, as, as a health professional, we'd probably have to be hard-pressed finding a disease state that is not associated or has inflammation as a key driver. And it turns out that these microbes are 
potentially one of, if not the key, key driver of that inflammatory cascade that's going on in, in the body. And conversely, if you have a, a different group of bacteria growing, you actually have an anti-inflammatory driver. So these microbes are, are ensuring that your, your gut integrity is good and they're producing compounds that have anti-inflammatory effects body-wide and help modulate how your immune system responds. So, the, I mean, these these culturing techniques that were commonplace at the time. I mean, I, I, correct. I mean, we both have we have anaerobic and aerobic bacteria, and it's reasonably yeah. easy to culture aerobic because yeah. they're out in the they need air. But the challenge has always been anaerobes. Is that is that part of the problem? Was that part of the problem in the culturing? It is, it's certainly part of the problem, and and. Back in the I think late 1960s, there was a, a huge leap forward in microbiology because they developed anaerobic techniques. And they, before that, they you know could only see a small amount of what was in the gut. You need some E. coli, some lactobacilli, some microbes that could handle being exposed to oxygen. Aerobes. In the late 1960s, they developed anaerobic techniques and realized that oh, we had no idea <laughs> what was there. There's a huge leap that they could find a whole a whole bunch of new new genera that that they didn't know existed before. And similarly, in the early 2000s, there's another even bigger leap to, to give us an insight as to what species com compose um, people's gut ecosystems. And, and I think they've you know, isolated another 240 or 50 species wow. that they didn't know existed before from the early 2000s onward. This was with the DNA testing? Yeah. yeah. And, you're, and you're right. It, it was essentially, the, even with the best anaerobic techniques we had at the time, we, we still couldn't grow these things because they are so sensitive to oxygen that even the tiniest exposure would, would kill them off. You know, and culturing depends on having a live microbe and, and feeding it the right food that it needs and we can observe it and, and isolate it out from other, other competitive microbes and we can give it a name and et cetera and describe what it does. Um, but the, the change of DNA techniques allowed us to see what was there that was independent of having them alive when they exited the, the, um, into the toilet bowl, essentially. Yeah. And, and I mean, this is taking gut microbiology to a forensic level, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And certainly there's been evolution in, in, in tools that we're using and, and from tools that would allow us to see what, what genus or genera were present to ones that can go down to the very strain specific aspects and tell us what genes are, are, yeah. are, are present, even in microbes that we haven't named yet and we don't know what they do, but we can see what genes are actually present. Yeah. And really, I, I, I do, you know, uh, DNA based microbiota assessment with many of my patients. And we get this list of, you know, 100 different species that are there, the vast majority of which we still don't know what role they play and what they do because they've only recently been discovered, um, you know, and I think got another 10 or 15 years once researchers catch up to the backlog of research that needs to be done, we'll have a much better idea of, of um, the role of many of these different species. And, I, and, I'm, <clears throat> and I'm guessing that uh, the combination, it's a bit like environmental toxins, isn't it? Those kind of tests one toxin at a time and determine how its effect is on human health. And uh, yeah. that's very limited because that's not how we're exposed to environmental toxins. And the same would be true of the microbiome. Yeah, we could test one microbe at a time, but as soon as we add another one, then that's a combination. And we could certainly, you mentioned 250 that have just been identified in varying combinations. I mean, the research challenge is huge. It is. It is because you're right, because how they how one species re reacts on its own is completely different potentially to <laughs> reacts with another species, let alone dozens or hundreds of, of species that you'd actually have in a more a typical gut environment. Um, so it, it is very complex. And, and, and these days there are you know, thousands of researchers around the world trying to tease out these tease out these very, very same questions that we're discussing now. Yeah. But there are some general principles we know. For, I mean, just can you – I've heard the estimate of – human cells to microbial cells that are commonly on our body varying from twice the number of – there are twice the number of microbes to 10 times the number of microbes. Can you just clear up for me, yeah. Jason, what, what is the – what should we be saying when we make that statement? <laughs> that depends on whose paper you read. Ah. <laughs> there's, there's still debate and discussion around that between – that you, that you as a human being are 90% microbe and 10% non-microbe would be the, the most commonly um, used uh, ratio, but 
there are some more recent researchers are suggesting it. At, at the other extreme end of that would be half-half. It would be half microbial cells, half non-microbial cells to make up a human being. Right. I think most people are generally believe that we're more microbe than we are non-microbe as humans. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now that's good because, you know, well, I'd heard the 10 to 1 story, or, you know, 90% story, and then I'd heard yeah. the 2 to 1 story, and I thought, well, there's quite a range there, isn't there? I, I hope I, I want to get it right. Now, Now I wanted to um, also to ask some, some basics now. You know, I want to go back to uh, gut microbiome or microbiome 101. People are familiar with the term antibiotic. Uh, and actually experienced it from very early on in life. But we're starting, we're hearing the terms now prebiotic, probiotic, and I know you've even used the term symbiotic. Could we yes. just give our listener a little bit of a definition uh, of, of what those terms mean? Yeah, well, we can start with probiotic. Probiotic is it's a live microbe that, when administered in adequate amounts, confers the health benefit on the host. That's the strict definition that's been widely used probably the last um, decade. And there's a few bits that can be teased out from that because it's live, live microbes. So therefore, if you have a supplement that contains den, dead bacteria, it's no longer a, a probiotic at that point. Um, and then the other aspect of that definition is when it's administered in adequate amounts. So you actually have to have, to have a therapeutic dose involved with this process too, because if you have below a certain amount, then the microbes might be alive, but they won't have a therapeutic effect. And then the last bit of that definition is it has a health benefit when you ingest it. And in some parts of the world, they're very picky about this definition and that you can't call your your, your um, supplement a probiotic unless you have human clinical trials showing that there's health benefits associated with ingestion. Wow. Now, here in Australia, we're not, <laughs> we're not that, that picky about that. Um, but in some parts of the world, some parts of Europe, it's like, no, you can call it a microbial supplement um, or active culture supplement, but you can't call it a probiotic unless you have human clinical trials showing that they, your exact formulation, the exact strains contained in your formulation have a therapeutic effect. I find it interesting that we've got quite um, loose um, definitions used from a, from a commercial perspective here in Australia compared to elsewhere. Mm. Um, pre prebiotics are, are essentially... The best way of looking at them and, and like a selective fertilizer. So it's a substance that is selectively fermented by beneficial microbes in the gut and generally one or limited number of species. So it's a substance that is indigestible to, to humans. Um, it reaches the colon, the large, large intestine, where it then is selectively fermented. So only certain microbes out of the 100 plus that might be present have got the right machinery to break down or digest those compounds. And as a, as a consequence, when they consume it, they get an uh, ecological advantage and their population will increase. Um, and then it can then change the the environment locally because of their, their now larger amount of territory that they, they hold in the gut. And then we tend to see that associated with health benefits as well. So, so the prebiotic is not bacteria, but it's the fertilizer. It's what bacteria would feed on. Yes, but it's selected. The selectivity is what defines a prebiotic versus uh, a typical dietary fiber. A typical dietary fiber is not prebiotic because it might feed, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 different species or more. Um, that's still helpful when we still should be consuming lots of, of, of a wide diversity of, of fiber shapes and sizes for sure. And that's how we get a more diverse, healthy ecosystem. But prebiotics are, are defined by those selectivity that there might be one or two species out of the 100 plus in your gut that actually can break this down and do their populations do grow um, whereas the other populations don't when you when you introduce a prebiotic in, into the mix. Hmm. Going back to the probiotic, I'm often confused when I go into a, a health food store. Should I, I ha, you know, some are in the fridge and then uh, some are on the shelf and I kind of logically, I'm thinking, well, hang on, either they should be in the fridge or what's the difference? You know, when we have freeze dried and we have this, how do, how do we make sense of that as, we, as, as a consumer? Yeah. Now, most, most probiotic supplements are, are freeze dried and some strains have got a great degree of um, toughness, that's the right word for it, that they can handle room temperature. For, for, for years without losing any viability. Um, but there are others that are actually far more sensitive to environmental conditions that we know we, we need, if we want them to be alive when we consume them, um, we need to keep them in the fridge. 
And this is very much a, a strain specific trait. And th- these days, I mean, back in the old day, it was, it was you know, 20, 30 years ago, it was pretty random what things, what microbes showed up in a probiotic supplement. You know, there wasn't a great degree of systematic research that went into to choosing that particular um, microbe to put into a supplement. And that, that's changed dramatically over the last 20 years. So these days, thankfully, um, most of the probiotic supplements out there have actually, the strains contained in them have actually gone through a, a, a battery of, of tests first before they were ever developed commercially. And that battery of tests would include, can they survive stomach stomach acid? Can they survive bile and other digestive secretions? Um, can they you know, attach to your gut cells after you ingest them? There's basic criteria, but, but on top of that, they, they look to go, okay, can it survive at room temperature for, for a couple of years so it doesn't need to be refrigerated? So there's a lot of strains that have hit the marketplace in the last decade plus that actually were selected because they've got that hardiness. They can handle room temperature. So we can't necessarily assume that because a product is in the fridge, therefore it's better than one that's at room temperature. Um, it really depends on the quality of the strains. And, and most good companies would have, would have actually selected the storage um, method based on the hardiness of the strain that's contained in the supplement. Mm, mm. And what is your, so, okay, we've got those probiotics in their various forms, live microbes, uh, adequate amounts, health benefits. Um, What are your thoughts when we kind of look at it, food versus supplements? You know, how do we, how do we wade through this? For both, for both probiotic and prebiotic. Okay, well, looking, let's look at probiotics first, and mm-hmm. and I think the most recent definition of probiotics clearly separated out um, typical fermented foods that they said were essentially sources of um, live and active cultures, and not probiotics. So they would put things like kombucha, sauerkraut, kimchi, kumis, kefir, um, all in that category. That you, yes, you get exposure to live and active microbes or cultures, but um, essentially, they said they don't meet the definition, the strict definition of, of probiotics because we don't, um, because of the inherent variability you have with wild ferments um, in terms of numbers of microbes, species of microbes, strains of microbes, we can't actually guarantee it's going to have any sort of therapeutic effects. Therefore, we won't call it a, a, a probiotic. So you've got this, those sort of more traditional ferments, which I still widely eat. I just want to say that they're not like... They're just you can't rely on them for specific therapeutic effects in the same way you can a well-defined, well-characterized strain sound in, in probiotic supplements. But you do get some fermented foods where they actually add specific therapeutically um, active strains to their finished product. And so there'll be, for me, there's this brand of yogurts that I call food yogurts, and there's medicinal yogurts. And medicinal yogurts um, essentially have been spiked with therapeutic strains of bacteria that with, with you know, clinical trials showing that they're, they do things, <laughs> that they have therapeutic effects um, versus just food yogurts that are just, they taste good. You're getting some, some microbes in varying amounts, which will differ batch to batch, um, but still will have some general health benefit like enhanced immune response, for example, but, but nothing very specific. Um, and you'll find that, that even in the realms of kombucha uh, that you can buy commercially or, or kefir you could buy commercially uh, around the world, some, some companies deliberately spike their products with a therapeutic strain on top of the wild ferments to ensure that it has a therapeutic effect beyond just you know, being a, a tasty fermented beverage. So the thing that defines uh, its, its claim to be a probiotic is its specificity as well. Which is that that third criteria of providing a health benefit, a specific health benefit? That's right, because because a traditional fermented food like sauerkraut will probably, you know, have live microbes when you're consuming it, um, because you know, particularly if you make it yourself, it should be alive, mm. and and it mm. should, based on research, have a therapeutic amount of microbes. That with a teaspoon of sauerkraut is about 100 million lactobacilli at typically. Um, but what you don't know is that the, the strain of lactose plantarum that's found in your sauerkraut, which would be different than the one that's found in mine, mm-hmm. if it has any therapeutic effects, whether it will survive gastric acid or bile salt, whether it will compete against you know, you know, pathogens or, or uh, bad bugs in your gut. We don't have that, that specific sort of data. Whereas with a, a, a good supplement, we'd have that sort of specific data. We, so we'd know for sure that it can meet those basic criteria, but it might have an additional therapeutic effect on top of that, like um, 
decreasing inflammation in the gut or improving transit time for people that have got slow, slow chronic transit time, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the, the, pre-bi- the prebiotic, uh, I mean, I've often I've, I've picked up a, a sauerkraut in the health food store, organic sauerkraut, looked very impressive, and then I read the fine print and it had been pasteurised. Ah. And I thought, gee, that seems like a contradiction in ambiguities there. I mean, why would you pasteurize something that you want? But but then maybe it's a prebiotic, just the fertilizer for the is are, are those kind of fermented foods could they be called prebiotics or is that not specific enough? Not not really because uh, what you've really done is is pre-digested the the food first, um, which also means that there's actually less less food for your indigenous populations than if you had it unfermented. So, you know, cabbage would, would probably feed your own microbes in your gut better unfermented than versus um, fermented. So, so if you make a head of the sauerkraut, the, the, the microbes that have created, you know, cabbage and, and turned it into sauerkraut, um, they, they've already pre-digested and eaten some of the same compounds that otherwise your gut bacteria would eat. So the, the compounds that that we tend to see most as, as classic prebiotics would be things like fructo oligosaccharides or inulin um, that we find in a, a range of natural food items from onions and garlic to um, asparagus, burdock roots, dandelion roots, Jerusalem artichokes. Um, so some of those foods are not so widely consumed in the last hundred years, but used to be widely consumed by humans. Um, and then we get galacto oligosaccharides that we find mostly in, in legumes. And those compounds, um, essentially because of the, the shape of them, they're oligosaccharides, which means that they're um, in between a, a sugar and a fiber in terms of size. Fibers are much generally longer and or polysaccharides are much longer. Um, and these are medium size, but humans don't have the, the framework to or the machinery to break down those oligosaccharides. They reach the colon and there they're selectively fermented by those microbes that can utilize them, often microbes like bifidobacteria that people are quite familiar with to other microbes that we're often not so familiar with because they've only recently been isolated and um, named, species like Acromansia and Fecalobacterium prosnitii that are really important key key gut species that most people don't even know exist that are, are fed by, by us and it, consuming these these prebiotic compounds. Um, and you can also get them separated out into supplements. You can get, you know, fruit oligosaccharides as a powder or glass oligosaccharides as a powder. Um, but you can, those, in, in this case, eating the, the, the whole food that contains those things also will give you that prebiotic effect as long as you get it, ingest a sufficient amount. Okay. So, and and symbiotics. Go on, tell me a bit about that because that's, that's an interesting one. Yeah, so symbiotic, the, the idea is is that you've actually combined a probiotic and a prebiotic together, um, and, then, and then that should enhance the survival of the you know, supplemented probiotic strain in the gut to you're giving it a specific food source that it likes. Um, I think the research has been mixed in terms of living up to its hype, but a part of that has been issues with finding, making sure that the, the exact strain used in your supplement um, can utilize that exact sugar that you're or prebiotic compound you're putting with it. And you would think that would be common sense, but you'd think wrong. <laughs> Most companies haven't bothered to do that. They just shove some you know, random probi- probiotic microbe with some, some oligosaccharides and assume that it's going to be able to ingest that and enhance its survival characteristics in the gut or have some sort of additional therapeutic benefit. But um, that's not always clear uh, from, from what we had commercially available. But you, know, mm. you, you can, if you have a certain amount of knowledge or a practitioner does is, is combine, um, say, right, take this probiotic, take this prebiotic, which will feed that one up, take them the same same mouthful, and you should get enhanced um, numbers of that microbe um, for at least a short period of time whilst you're taking it. Mm. Now, now you've uh, also spent a good deal of your professional life and research uh, looking at digestive disorders. Um, what are some of the common ones you, that we see in our in our society now? And yeah, what, what what are some of those signs that that people might have that they've have these? Yeah, that's good. Good sort of question. A lot, a lot of questions there. Um, <laughs> in terms of my practice, I would see uh, irritable bowel syndrome patients or patients who were given that label of irritable bowel syndrome. IBS would probably make up the bulk of my practice these days. Um, my job is always to try to tease out what that means for them and what the, yeah. the, the cause of their gut symptoms are, because the most 
common symptoms for that sort of condition are um, abdominal pain or discomfort, uh, bloating, distension, and changes in bowel patterns. So like it might be constipation or it might be diarrhea. Um, those are signs more broadly that your gut function is not ideal, um, particularly pain, um, particularly distension, bloating, um, and, uh, and big changes in bowel patterns. So, you know, doing one bowel pattern a week, movement a week is, is a clear sign that things are not going well. And doing seven a day is a clear sign that things are not well. Also having blood in your stool or mucus in your stool also signs that, that there's something amiss further up that needs to be investigated and treated. Now, IBS is kind of a broad term, isn't it, really, that, that kind of uh, this needs to have been going on not just for a couple of days, but for a minimum of? Three months, typically, Three months. With, with current definitions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's more of a, more of a chronic uh, condition that, that's, for many people, episodic, but some people have got symptoms all day, every day as well, mm. so that's it. Variable per person, but it, it is very much an umbrella term that just if you have these symptoms, then we're going to label it as IBS. As long as you don't have these other, you know, like inflammatory bowel disease or these other conditions, we sort of rule these ones out. That's that's what's supposed to happen anyway. Um, but then it's it's really a matter of working out what what the issue is because many from seeing you know I've been treating IBS patients for 18 years that, that there's no one thing that's a problem for all IBS patients and and the the challenge of the clinician is is working out what what's the driver of those symptoms for this individual patient who's sitting in front of you because it'll be different from the next person with IBS and and then you know the, these two terms sound almost so alike but they are quite different IBS IB irritable bowel syndrome irritable bowel disease is that an umbrella term for those other ones like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's and all that, or, or are they separate again? I, IBD or inflammatory bowel disease yeah, it would, is, is quite different, and, and it does sound similar, IBS, IBD, but yep. they're, they're quite separate. Because IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, is a functional condition that we don't see associated in general with, with, with severe gut, gut damage. There might be mild, minor degree of inflammation, but it's, it's, it's defined as, as, a, as a functional condition, whereas the inflammatory bowel diseases are, are often associated with generally more severe symptoms of, you know, frank blood coming out in your, your poo and doing um, severe pain and actual tissue tissue damage and severe levels of inflammation. So the, the severity um, is, is much greater in general with inflammatory bowel disease, but the two key ones that fit that category, the most common ones would be ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, but you also get collagenous colitis and microscopic colitis, and even some uh, idiopathic colitis that we, your colon's inflamed, we don't know why. <laughs> so often a diagnosis that people come with to, to my practice, and then our, my role is to try to tease out why <laughs> there is inflammation in their, their colon. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I, I often, I'm a kind of a message that I think is worth telling people is that each and every day your body sends you a report card and uh, lets you know how you're doing and the question is do you listen to it or not and and you've mm -hmm. mentioned bloating and and uh, wind I guess also and reflux and heart these to some people this is normal but it's not is it well, some of, I mean, I, I would say wind is normal. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to clarify Good. that too. That, that the farting is totally normal, and you will fart more when you eat more whole plant foods. Mm -hmm. Everybody will produce more gas. What's not normal, which which is a sign that there's something wrong, is when you get bloating and distension, or your 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 gut balloons out like you're nine months pregnant. Hey, that's a sign of of dysfunction, and something's not quite right. You know, pooing once every two or three days. Is dysfunctional, um, and even if you don't have symptoms here and now, besides just pooing every two or three days, it will probably lead to, to some negative sequelae later on, um, and it should be it should be addressed or the earlier stages rather than waiting twenty years for colon cancer to develop or something mm. along those lines. Yeah. So so okay, passing of wind, that's okay. Tick that box. Uh, bloating, not so good. Reflux, yeah. indigestion, heartburn. Those are certainly signs of something not. Going right, we shouldn't be having you know burning pain in our esophagus on, on a regular basis. You know? mm. And once a year, for if you have a big night out drinking, well, you'd expect that. But, yep. but a few times a week, no, that's that's a sign that something's abnormal, and you should get it sussed out. 
And typically, and I think you would see this all the time uh, of people coming into you that have suffered for, for a while, of course, the typical um, approach to that in, in our Western medical approach is take an antacid or take a protein pump inhibitor. They, they, they're yeah. huge selling products. What are some of the problems with that approach? Ah, well, I mean, it's fascinating the research that's come out the last four years or plus, but, but there's been a lot looking at the microbiota um, consequences of proton pump inhibitors. You know, if you, if you go back to some of the earlier research that was done on them, they were shown to be anab have antibiotic like effects back in the early days of development. Um, and people have sort of forgotten that. The reason it, it's used as part of that sort of triple therapy to kill Helicobacter pylori, which is the main microbe that's involved with causing stomach ulcers, um, or peptic ulcers more, more broadly, um, the main reason it's used is because it does kill H. pylori. But, but we've forgotten um, that they have antibacterial effects and we're taking this thing not just for two weeks, we're mm. taking this medication daily for years and for many, many years and in, in, in cases in many, many patients. And what research has shown over the last four years is that it has an antibacterial-like effect in the gut and it's killing off bacteria in the colon. And these people that have been on proton pump inhibitors for long periods of time, so these are the things that are often just prescribed in huge amounts for, for reflux, um, actually have similar damage to their ecosystem as if they've been on prolonged antibiotics for, for months months at a time. It's actually caused massive shifts in diversity, so extinctions of species um, occurring in the microbiota and um, decreased levels of, of a range of beneficial anti-inflammatory species and an increase in levels of, of gut pro-inflammatory species. It's really fascinating to see the tease out with, with what's been occurring in the, the colon as a consequence of these meds. And other things we knew for a while, like you had increased risk of osteoporosis and increased risk of pneumonia because all of a sudden your, your stomach, which is supposed to be essentially sterile, because you've got this really strong stomach acid to kill any microbes that you ingest or to prevent any sort of backlog of microbes from, from, from coming from lower down in the gut. Um, when you take that proton pump inhibitor, it inhibits your stomach acid from being, being very potent at all. And research has found that these people that take them will often have molds, they'll have yeast, and they'll have a whole range of bacteria growing in the stomach. And it's a pretty easy journey from the stomach into to the lungs, so they're much greater risk of bacterial pneumonia, for example. And, and for our listener who's sitting there thinking, oh, well, yeah, the protein pump inhibitors, that's no good. Thank goodness I'm only on Nexium. Or... <laughs> so what are some common brand names that just to alert our listener to the fact that there are really much quite common uh, medication? What are, what are they? I think Nexium is a big one. There's like 10 million prescriptions every year in Australia. Yes. 10 million. It's a for, blockbuster. For a country of like 20 some million. Yep. <laughs> Yep. It's scary the amount that's being prescribed. Yeah, um, but so. yeah, Nexium, Lozec, Somac are, are, are common ones. Most people that are prescribed a medication for reflux are taking a proton pump inhibitor. They may not know it by that name. Um, and some, some recent research was, was looked at, at whether people were taking them um, based on, on, on sound reasoning or good rationale. And they, the research was suggesting that, that between 25 and 70% of people that were taking proton pump inhibitors um, in the current here and now were doing so inappropriately and didn't need to be on them. So um, mm -hmm. it may be something that's worth revisiting, thinking of as alternatives based on the, 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 the current data sets, because there's even linking it now with um, increased risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, proton pump inhibitor use. And, and then that makes full sense if you think about the, the damage to the clonic microbiota that we're having as a consequence and the types of species that increase um, due to proton pump inhibitor use and their pro-inflammatory byproducts, it, which, which are being linked in other research to Alzheimer's disease. So it fits what you'd expect to happen in that situation. Yeah. Another, I mean, you know, this report card that we keep that we keep getting every day is bowel movements, and and you've just kind of said once every two. What is normal? What what does one? What would one consider? What would you consider, given your knowledge, uh, that uh, is normal bowel movement, frequency and form? Frequency and form here, Jason. You can get specific. Oh, can I? That's cool. <laughs> so, and I'll clarify from from a medical perspective, they they would say that that. Three bowel movements a week is one extreme of, of normality through to three bowel movements a day. So, so if you're between three bowel movements a week to three bowel movements a day, you'd fit normal. And that would fit in that, that bell curve that most Westerners would fit in within that, that spectrum. And that's why it's defined as normal. Now, from my perspective as a clinician um, and who's familiar with, with the, the gut area, that I would say someone who's doing a poo every two days 
is not <laughs> It's not great. You need to do at least one poo a day, yeah. um, and ideally two or three. I think, think if you're eating a promptly whole food, plant based diet with tremendous amounts of fibers and mixture of fibers and polyphenols, Mediterranean style diet, you're going to be pooing generally two times a day. Would be pretty pretty common, and certainly, um, I'd be concerned. I'm concerned with patients who who don't poo daily. And the other aspect of that is looking at at your your what we what I call bowel transit time. And one of the things I get all my patients to do is a very simple home experiment of eating some corn on the cob, hmm. ensuring you don't chew it very well, write down or put on your phone when you when you ate the corn, then look for it in your poo. And and this is fascinating because you have some other patients that are doing a poo every single day. They've got no sort of obvious, you know, gut pain or discomfort that they would you'd think would it be associated with constipation, for example, and they don't meet this definition of constipation because they're doing a poo every day. But it still took 10 days from that corn to go from their mouth to the toilet. Wow. Pool. 10 days. Wow. Uh, despite the fact they were doing a normal poo daily, both in terms of form and frequency. Wow. Um, yeah, and I've got other patients who were 21 days for the corn to go from wow. mouth to toilet bowl. And that's completely abnormal. What is good uh, bowel transit time? You know, a bolus of yeah. food, how long should it take, ideally, to pass down through the other end? I would suggest between 16 and 24 hours mm. is ideal. If it's below sort of 12 hours, it essentially goes through relatively quickly, which means you may not have absorbed all the, the goodness out of the food at that time point. And when it's much quicker than that, then you can you can see that you have to absorb much of the goodness out of that food. Um, longer than 24 hours, it means you're just reabsorbing a lot of those compounds in your poo that you otherwise wouldn't be. But think of the one that's 10 days or 20 days, you're mm. absorbing a lot of, of, you know, bacterial byproducts, but also other compounds that your body's trying to get rid of. Because one of the main elimination routes your body uses is, is essentially bile that comes out and it's supposed to be pooed out. Mm. And if you're reabs- if it's got 10 days of brewing time in your colon, you're going to be reabsorbing some of those bits and pieces that your body's trying to get rid of. So this concept of auto toxification, you know, like food that has yeah. sat in your bowel, in your gut for too long um, in that whole digestive system, reabsorbing toxins within the system is a reality. I, I think, I think, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily define it as, as, as food being, being sitting around too long, but, but certainly the food, you know, the, the poo break, breakdown products. Yep. Yes. Because you you'll certainly be reabsorbing stuff, and we know that you'll you'll reabsorb a range of of compounds that your body was trying to get rid of via via the bile. For example, you're going to absorb more bacterial byproducts, um, the, ne- the negative pro-inflammatory ones when it when it's sitting around for that long. That that yeah. that's clear. So so I think you need to be aware of that on top of yeah, you should be doing a poo daily. Check to see how long it takes for stuff to go through your gut because that's not obvious. And when my patients have done it, they're like, I'm sure it's just 24 hours. I always a poo poo daily. It's like, well, you can't make that assumption. Do yep. the test. Yeah. And then they're often surprised at the results. Like, well, oh, I do poo daily. And I had no idea it took 10 days for <laughs> you know, food to go from one end to the other. Yeah. And corn is a good one, isn't it? Because it doesn't seem to matter how much you chew it, there's corn. <laughs> yeah. And it's because we, we, we lack the, you know, um, ability to break down cellulose and those little corn nibs have got a little protective cellulose envelope around them. Mm-hmm. Um, and us as Westerners have, have sadly lost many, many of our cellulose digesting bacteria from our guts. So it will come out intact <laughs> because we can't eat it. And our few of our microbes that we have as Westerners can consume that cellulose envelope around the corn as well. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious. I'm shocked to hear that three times a week is even on the normal range. It's just... Uh, yeah, that, so just much. incredible. So but listen, um, still on that subject, because, uh, you know, I know the Bristol stool chart, and maybe we'll have links to this because this has raised people's, um, you know, interest, piqued their interest in the shape of the uh, the message that's in the toilet yep. bowl. What do you think of the Bristol? St- you know, is, there, is that a good way? I love the Bristol, and, and I've got like a laminated poster I bring out for all my patients. To, right, right. Yeah, the pick what poo is most closely yep. represent what they do. Yep. So with the Bristol... The, the, what's, what's defined as normal is types three, four, and five. Yeah. And this is important to note because some people get really fixated on type four, which is that sort of hard log. And if they do a type five, they think that their gut's dysfunctional. I've had patients who've got no symptoms, wrong, nothing wrong with them at all, great health, who just do a type five poo twice a day, who think that there's some gut dysfunction because they're not doing one hard log daily. So it's important that we break 
down that misinformation that types three, four, and five are all normal and be going to one to three times a day is ideal. Terrific. Oh, that's good, G. Now, that's, I think that, I, I, I really do. I, I really believe that report card is something we should be listening to. The other one is skin because of people a lot often don't associate skin problems with digestive problems. And I'm sure most people who have been to see their skin specialist, their skin specialist may not have asked them very much about that. But there is a connection, isn't there? Yeah, for, for a number of skin conditions, and I'd say that list is ever growing. <laughs> There's more obvious ones for those, you know, skin conditions associated with celiac, for example, um, uh, dermatitis herpetiformis, I think it is, um, for that one. But but uh, but even the more common ones like psoriasis or atopic eczema, yep. very common skin conditions that that now are having a a prominent link to to gut dysfunction and and permeability issues as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, now uh, back onto the microbiome and the antibiotics. Anti antibiotics, in fact, uh, you know, we know they affect uh, bacteria and our, our microbiome and they have far reaching effects. Given what we know about the importance of all of these things, what, how should we be approaching um, a, a course of antibiotics? What do, you, what do you think the best advice, when, you know, when someone comes into you and says, oh, my, my doctor or dentist has just prescribed a, a Moxil, 500 milligrams, 20 capsules, three times a day, what should I be doing? I mean, I just... I'll just take a little step back first off, and, and I think the, the best thing that, that you as a, as a consumer can do is, is actually verify that it's really, really needed and never Necessary. ask yes. for them. Because yes. um, I think that can put on, on pressure on practitioners and they feel like they should they should do something. And if they're not that familiar with the fact that that course of amoxicillin might wipe out certain species forever in your gut and it might take two years for things to normalize uh, again from a gut dysfunction for, uh, species perspective, they may be thinking, oh, okay, well, yeah, um, I know it's not super indicated, but I don't want to make you leave the office with nothing because uh, they'll feel bad because they do want to help. Um, there's, there's that aspect to it. And we know for viral infections, I think there's some Australian data from Medical Journal of Australia last year showing that 85% of Australians are prescribed antibiotics for viral bronchitis. Um, we just got no chance of actually being remotely helpful for. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to make sure that they're actually needed for the indication that there aren't. They're off, oftentimes where they are, where they're life-saving, limb-saving, and we need to take them. And in that, that particular instance, then we should do our best to try to limit both the side effects to the that you're going to experience with them, and and also the level of damage that are going to occur consequently to your ecosystem, and then help restore it as quickly as possible to a healthier state. Um, so there's a number of strategies we can put in place. One of the core aspects is taking the right probiotic during the antibiotics. And you see, I stressed a couple of components there that not all probiotics help; only some do. We have plenty of research showing this, and doing it during the antibiotics. So ideally you want to space it out by two or three hours from the antibiotic as much as you can, but you don't want to wait till afterwards. So if you wait till afterwards, you're going to have increased side effects from the antibiotics and greater damage to your gut ecosystem. So it, it makes no sense to wait till afterwards. We've got 25 plus years of research showing clearly that if you take the right probiotic, it will reduce the side effects, reduce the risk of antibiotic associated diarrhea dramatically, reduce the risk of, you know, um, overgrowth of pathogens like Clostridium difficile as a consequence of that, and then limit the damage to the ecosystem. So it, it's a no-brainer to do it alongside. Um, sadly, this research has only slowly <laughs> filtering out. And if anyone tells you that there's not enough evidence that probiotics should be used along with antibiotics, they are, sorry, ignorant <laughs> of the current state of research. We've got meta-analyses coming out of our eyeballs showing that the right probiotic is, is useful in this situation. So it's, it's, it's pure ignorance in that case of, of what the research is saying. Um, and then the other core aspect is, is doing prebiotics afterwards to help restore those very important um, anti-inflammatory sort of gut healing species that would have been knocked around like Fecalobacterium, Bifidobacteria, Acromandia, those are the ones um, um, and any other beta ray producing microbes that I'm really focusing on um, post-antibiotics to, to help restore their populations quickly. Because those are the ones that are often knocked around. We, we know now that antibiotics is just not two weeks or four weeks. It's, it's months um, of 
for, for things to re- repair back to normal. So, um, and some species do go extinct with, with potentially every course of antibiotics in, in some people. So um, once they're extinct, there's not much we can do about that um, besides doing fecal transplants, which is another another whole talk. Mm. But but we can restore populations that as long as there's survivors, we can we can nourish those survivors and bring them up to the point where they're healthy populations again. And that's where prebiotics for at least three months after antibiotics are, are key. Yes, and and that's interesting, um, <clears throat> the spacing out, because something like, for example, amoxyl is taken with meals three times a day. So in between those meals and maybe yeah. two hours after your dinner before bed, you would take a, pre, a pro, probiotic, probiotic, specific, exactly. specific being the key, not just any, but specific. Yeah. Yeah, because we've got clear clear data. Like there was a study done in, in the UK published maybe four or five years ago where they gave 60 billion CFE or 60 billion bacteria, you know, two different types of lactobacilli, two different types of bifidobacteria. It didn't help mm-hmm. <laughs> at all. And yet you've got other research using um, a particular probiotic called Lactose Remnosis, uh, no, sorry, um, GG, that definitely works at, at a, you know, a, a billion or 10 billion um, microbes per dose, or another one called Lactose Reutri DSM17938, which I know is a very catchy name, yeah. um, that works at 100 million per, yeah. per day. You know, and it's just like, wow, so the right one works even at 300 times less dose mm-hmm. <laughs> compared to just taking a random one at, at high amounts, thinking that a high potency multi strain one will fix the situation. It's not as mm-hmm. simple as that. It's choosing the right one that has the right attributes for, for this scenario. I mean, I mean, the, uh, the take-home message here is, A, if your doctor has said there's no re- evidence to support um, X, Y, Z, you, you, know, you, you know what they really mean or should be saying is they haven't read it. Number two, um, that this is very specific. So we do need a practitioner who is aware of the specificity of these probiotics. And three, we need to continue the prebiotics for at least three months afterwards. Yeah, and and I would do, and I agree with all those three statements, and certainly the the second one in terms of the right probiotic, and I think getting advice from a health practitioner increases your chance. A probiotic literate health practitioner mm. will increase the chance of actually getting the desired outcome because it, it you're, there's a good decent chance of missing if you're just randomly choosing products off the shelf, um, which is a waste of your money. Yeah. Um, whereas we know there's certain products that will definitely. <laughs> help based on, on sometimes meta-analysis level data, that there's no doubt that they'll be, be helpful in your situation. Um, yeah. And for the health practitioners listening to this too, I mean, is there a difference between, you know, when someone's on amoxyl and someone's on erythros and a, a tetracycline, say, you know, different types of antibiotics, uh, obviously they require different probiotics? One would think that would be the case. Sadly, we're lacking any sort of systematic investigation into the area. And so what we we do have is studies where they've, you know, very pragmatic studies of giving people on a whole range of antibiotics and they give them the probiotic and it it helps. And it might be that it might help in three quarters of people and there's 25% of people it didn't work for. And and that would still be a very positive outcome in the whole trial. Um, But you're right that it might be. And, and systematic research into the future will hopefully define this in greater degree of, of which probiotic supplement is ideal to go alongside which antibiotic because we don't have that sort of data at this time. But what we, what we do have for some antibiotics is, is um, some knowledge of the d- degree of microbiota um, disruption that we get. So what species are, are, are mostly uh, impacted by that antibiotic as, as collateral damage. Uh, and that can help fine tune our use of prebiotics of going, okay, well, I can give you the right fertilizer for these species that were really bashed around by this antibiotic course. Um, so that sort of data we've got some of. It's again, it hasn't been done systematically um, to nearly the, enough detail, in, in my opinion. But there's some data there. But the probiotic area is is way behind in that respect, mm. and we may never actually get get there. In all honesty, because it takes so much money to run clinical trials um, and to run one with all the different courses of antibiotics with all different strains of probiotics, it's it's never going to happen. Yeah. Now the the other were you know we've done quite a few programs with farming and agriculture and of course I've done some stuff with oral health as well and the oral microbiome is pretty important as well and the one word that seems to come up in each of those situations is diversity. The more diverse, the more the better. Would you agree? Is that is that the case with the gut microbiome? For the colonic microbiota, definitely. Yeah. There's there's. But no doubt, and if you asked 
you know, a hundred microbiot experts, um, what, what define the healthy ecosystem, all hundred would agree on diversity. They might disagree on some other points, mm -hmm. but all would agree on, on importance of diversity. And we, we know from considerable research that's been done in the last, you know, probably five or six years that, that, if the low diversity or lack of microbial diversity is associated with increased risk of allergies and asthma in kids, increased risk of obesity, um, insulin resistance like from type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia like high cholesterol, high triglycerides, autoimmunity, and importantly, just body-wide inflammation. And you just look at that list that I've just laid out. That's you know what we see as as, as chronic Western diseases that, that we see associated with this lack of, of diversity. And and it's true that most Westerners, if we compared us to um, you know hunter gatherer societies, we've lost a decent chunk of our diversity already from you know three generations of antibiotics to you know sections birth to formula feeding, um, proton pump inhibitor use. You know we've uh, never mind the, the Western diet, which is not particularly good at feeding our our microbiome. Um, there, there are consequences, and that's what we're seeing seeing now. Mm -hmm. Now, now, look. Uh, let's just uh, because we've talked about specificity and the importance of being being specific about our probiotic and, and, and our prebiotics. But if the listener now, just uh, giving our listeners something to go away with, if they were wanting to focus on establishing and maintaining their best microbiome, they could. Uh, they want to feed their friends, not their foes. Yeah. What would be a few tips you might leave them with uh, to say this okay. is this is my advice? Yeah, the, the research thankfully is, is pretty clear on on the ways to improve diversity. The, the best way of improving diversity is increasing the diversity and types of whole plant foods you eat. That is by far the most effective way of improving diversity because we tend to see this, this idea that fiber is fiber is fiber. It's not. <laughs> Fiber in broccoli is going to be different than the fiber found in um, spelt versus um, the fiber found in black beans, for example. And we feed different microbes and we get different combinations of fiber shapes and sizes with different foods. So the literature is clear that if we expand our diversity of, of foods, and I, I give my patients a, a target of 40 plus whole plant foods per week, not per day, but per week, um, as just something that's, that's achievable, and some patients go well beyond that to 50 and 60 per week, that, that they're getting a, the widest variety of shapes and sizes and types of dietary fibers and soluble fibers, insoluble, pectins, gums, and mucilages um, possible. That, so that's the, the, the core aspect, and also having wide color variety in your diet too. So food, you know, having purple carrots and purple potatoes and red carrots and red rice and black rice and black beans. Getting that variety of color means you're getting a variety of compounds called polyphenols. And those polyphenols tend to also be used as a food source for our more um, for a range of, of beneficial species in the gut as well. Um, so it tends to nourish up those species that produce antimicrobial or sort of anti-inflammatory compounds for us or, or gut healing compounds for us. In fact, the convert when they eat those polyphenols, those blue compounds we find in blueberries or black currants or blackberries, those those sort of color compounds, um, they do, we know that they're associated with a range of health benefits and sort of antioxidant and anti cancer properties. But we don't get that benefit until those polyphenols reach the colon where they work as a food source for microbes and they, they break that polyphenol down to a smaller component which we then absorb and that's how we get the benefit from those food. So it's this lovely um, relationship that we have that we feed them and they nourish us as, as a consequence, consequence of that. So it's a wide diversity of plant foods, a wide variety of color. Those are probably the, the, the core aspects from a diet perspective. Um, moderate amounts of exercise seems to help improve diversity scores as well. And getting seven hours or more sleep per night, which I'm not always good at doing, <laughs> also improves diversity scores too. Terrific. Wow. All of that music to my ears. Now, listen, I just finally, I just want to take a step back from your role as a naturopath, uh, you know, with all the research and reading you've done, because we're all on a health journey in, in our own lives. What do you think the biggest challenge is for people on their health journey in our modern world? I mean, I'm going to look at it from, from my own lens, obviously, which is, which is it's just gut lens and gut bacteria lens. And I think the, the biggest challenge that I, I suppose I see clinically um, and, and around me um, in terms of the diseases that are on a rise in, in this society is, is protecting and nourishing the gut microbiota. Um, because if, when we don't do that, there are long-term consequences. And as I said before, that's what we're seeing 
uh, on a societal level with chronic disease now are the long-term consequences of what Martin Blazer in, in New York calls the, the disappearing microbiota, that there are consequences of us, us losing key pivotal species that we've evolved alongside with, that we're losing fun- functionality that we didn't even know we had um, because we were so late into to the piece of actually researching it. So I think protecting that ecosystem and optimizing that ecosystem is, is perhaps the biggest issue that I see currently. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. It's been fantastic. Uh, I'm going to have links to your website and you've got such great resources as well and you're out teaching all the time. But thank you for joining me today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure having such a conversation. I enjoyed it as usual. Yes. Well, in case you thought all probiotics were made equally, uh, the well, the importance of specificity should not be underestimated. You may need to actually consult a knowledgeable health practitioner, an integrative doctor, a naturopath or a nutritionist well-versed in what that really means. I've often said that health practitioners, when I hear of health practitioners or so-called experts make a statement like, there is no evidence to support X, Y or Z, what they really should be saying, in all honesty, is they have not read any evidence. There's a very, very big difference there. The other thing is this daily report card. Each and every day, your body sends you a message, a report card on how what you are eating is affecting you. Bloating, reflux, constipation, diarrhea, skin problems. They're all messages. Now, protein pump inhibitors are an excellent example of how Western medicine approaches health. For example, acid reflux, Take an antacid or Nexium, Losec, Somac, problem solved. Well, not exactly. Listen to your body and respond accordingly. Find out the cause. Don't just settle for the symptom or the management of the symptom because after a few years, months or years, uh, other problems will emerge. Now, diversity is another word I love. Whether we are talking about the soil microbiome, the oral microbiome, or the gut microbiome, the more diverse, the more resilient, and the healthier you will be. Rather than taking this adversarial approach to microbes, most of which are friendly, nurture your friends and build diversity. I think it's a great metaphor for the world in which we live and the people that make it up, but that's a whole other story. Well, we'll have links to that Bristol stool chart. Remember, types three, four, and five, you're fine. Don't forget to go onto iTunes as well. Leave a review if you have been enjoying this podcast. It helps get this message out. And what is that message? Take control of your health and be the best you can be. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests.